he taught was the highest view, highest view of emptiness, of selflessness. But for some people that would have been overwhelming. So temporarily he gave a slightly different teaching. Of course only for the time being until their mind became more flexible, meditating on what they've heard became more flexible, they became, um, their, their insight grew deeper. And then of course the, they were taught the deeper kind of truth. So, but not in that kind of manner of like jumping right into it, but rather according to what they needed. So that way the Buddha traveled all over India, central north, northern India, and he had these great disciples with him who had, many of them had, had um, attained shamatha, a very deep level of concentration. And so, as we all know, concentration, the better your concentration, the better your memory. And so many of the disciples who traveled with the Buddha, who were present during the teachings, who received the teachings, because of their deep levels of concentration, they remembered exactly what the Buddha had taught. And at some point then, after the Buddha passed away, all this was written down and categorized. So the disciples of the Buddha, who themselves had reached very high levels of realizations, of insight, having been around the Buddha, having understood what the Buddha taught, they got a good sense of how to classify now this huge amount of different teachings, in particular with regard to emptiness. Not so much with regard to love, compassion, etc. That was pretty straightforward, the Four Noble Truths, etc. So those were for all the philosophical, or from the point of view of the different philosophical views, they were all the same for everyone. But with regard to emptiness, this needed now to be classified. What, what, what was it of what the Buddha taught that had to be interpreted, that needed to be explained, and what could be taken literally? So some of the teachings were right on, top, like, um, spot on, as in like, phenomena don't exist inherently, the eye doesn't exist like that, phenomena other than the eye don't exist like that. So they were, could be taken just like that and were then categorized as the uh, Madhyamika, that is the middle way teachings, and of those, the Madhyamika Prasangika, the highest teachings. And then there were other teachings that were not talking of inherent existence, but the dependence of object on a mind. Then there were those teachings saying that nothing exists externally, so mind only teachings, etc. So in that way, the, the masters at the time of the Buddha, after the Buddha's passing away, going through these different teachings, they realized, oh, we can classify those teachings into different philosophical schools. So four of them came about. This is how the four schools came into existence. Okay. But as I said, in particular with regard to the subtlest teachings, the teachings on emptiness, those were really hard to understand. And I mean, the fact that I, this is taught here now in the 21st century, you may argue, well, this should be kept kind of secret even nowadays because it was difficult to understand when the Buddha was around. So that was only taught to a few people. Why is it taught so openly? And I guess there are different ways of looking at that. One way, which is a more negative way, would be like saying, well, we're not really like the people at the time of the Buddha. We don't sit down right away with deep concentration, meditate on this, and are, are in danger of falling into extreme of nihilism, because we don't take it to that level. I mean, many of the followers of the Buddha, because of their meditative skills, they took right away what the Buddha had taught and put it into practice. And if it was overwhelming, well, were basically harmed by the teachings. That would be one way of looking at it. But another way could be, well, we were all around at the time of the Buddha. We've lived before, we were around, now our mind is mature. <laughs> now our mind is more mature than at the time then, and so we're ready to hear the full teachings. Who knows what it is? Anyway, so nowadays these teachings are more widely available, as we all know. Um, but even at the time of Nagarjuna, he already made them more uh, available, more widely available, and he wrote many different texts so he wrote on the first wheel, the first turning of the wheel. Uh, there's a, 
these are described as collections. So collections of advice. The Buddha gave advice. So collect. Sorry, Nagarjuna gave advice based on the first turning of the wheel. So the precious garland. Precious garland is a text that you may have heard of. Um, he taught this to a king. Uh, so it's a collection of different advice he gave to the king, like in terms of how to be a good politician, how to live a, a good lay life, how to conduct yourself, to be born in your in your business um, dealings, etc. So that's the precious garland. And then there's the letter to a friend, and again where he gives just advice for a lay person, basically. So. Um, if you live and work in society, if you continue to live, you don't become ordained, how should you conduct yourself? So for an ordinary person, basically. Uh, it's a letter to a friend. Then there's another text called Tree of Wisdom, 100 Wisdoms, Drops for Healing Beings, Commentary on Bodhicitta, also very important. So that's said to be part of the first turning of the wheel, although Commentary on Bodhicitta is a Mahayana teaching, and the first turning of the wheel is not associated with the Mahayana teachings, but still, because it's a kind of advice, it's part of that uh, collection. All right. And then the second turning of the wheel, the, the Nagarjuna composed a very important uh, collection of teachings collect, called the Collection of Middle Way Reasoning. Um, Umaritsotru in Tibetan, Yuktikaya in, in, in Sanskrit. So basically five different texts. Sometimes they, they add a sixth text, the Ratnavalida or the precious garland that was mentioned before is sometimes added. But strictly speaking, because um, this collection is mainly on the second turning of the wheel, the teachings on emptiness, Ratnavali should not be part of it. So you have this text that we're studying here, the root verses of the middle way on wisdom. Um, then there's another text called Refutation of Objections, um, which is basically, so Refutation of Objections is another text, then 70 stanzas on emptiness. Those are just kind of supplementary teachings on the text we're teaching here. So it's just kind of giving further explanation, uh, like supplementing Mula Madhyamika Karika, or the root verses of the middle way on wisdom. So um, the refutation on objections, it's, it's a commentary of the first chapter. The first chapter is really, really difficult. We're going to do this, but it comes at the end. It's really hard. This, is, uh, this was the nature of many Sanskrit texts, that the text started off with something really difficult, and then it got easier and easier. I guess nowadays we would do it the other way around. We explain easy ideas first, and then be really difficult. And it also depends. The Buddha started off with teachings that were not that hard, turning of the first wheel, and then it became really difficult. And then the third turning of the wheel, parts of it were difficult, and parts of it were kind of just explaining the, 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 the apparent contradiction of the first and the second um, chapter. But then the, the, the treatises, the commentaries on the, what the Buddha taught, they would sometimes be in the beginning so hard and then just get easier. Okay. So you have a refutation of objections. That's the commentary. This is the second. So the first is the one we have studied. The second of the collection of middle way reasoning is the refutation of objections. It deals with the first chapter. And then the third text is the 70 stanzas on emptiness. The 70 stanzas on emptiness, which is a commentary on the seventh chapter of the text we're studying. It's not part of this, but I'd really like to teach it. It's amazing. Together with Buddha Palita, with a commentary by someone called Buddha Palita. So if you were in Dharamsala this year, His Holiness is actually teaching this commentary on this text uh, called Buddha Palita. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. Anyway, so the seventh chapter is really amazing. It talks about how, like the arising of things, the abiding of things, and the disintegration of things, and like how that actually takes place. And it's Buddha Palita's text is amazing in terms of the logic, in terms of the reasoning. So hopefully one day we can, in particular, read Buddha Palita's chapters quite long, longer than than uh, Nagarjuna's explanation of the seventh chapter. But very important. 
And then the fourth text is 60 stanzas on reasoning. And then crushing to fine powder. I don't need to go through all of them. But just to give you a sense, all these different texts on reasoning. You can easily Google them. So the, the collection of teachings by Nagarjuna, I have a whole list of them. And then with regard to the third turning of the wheel, there's a collection of praises. Praise of Dhammadhatu, praise of the supramundane, praise of the inconceivable, praise of the ultimate. Those are not widely known. They're not as widely known as the text we are going to study. But it just gives you impression. Dhammadhatu took all the teachings of the Buddha, first turning, second turning, and third turning, and explained them. In a style where, which we may not find that helpful in the 21st century, but of course the style of writing, the style of teaching has changed over time. And so we need further commentaries, again, to explain what Nagarjuna is talking about. All right. So this gives you a little sense of Nagarjuna, the author himself. There's not that much known about him, only that he was born into a Brahmin family and generated a strong wish to spiritually practice. And he left his family, and it says that he didn't even take as much as a needle Nothing. He took nothing with him. Can you imagine that? You take, leave everything behind. Nothing. You don't take anything with you and go off to practice and meditate. So that's what he did. And he studied at the great Buddhist uh, monastic university called Nalanda. Became extremely prolific. Became a master in what are described as the six sciences. So nowadays, those six sciences, sorry, five sciences, those five sciences would be very different, like being knowledgeable in those, those areas of, or fields of study. Uh, but anyway, at the time of Nagarjuna, at the time of the Buddha, there were medicine, um, arts and crafts, more mechanical kind of arts and crafts, grammar, logic, and spiritual philosophy, as in like, in this case, Buddhist philosophy. So Nagarjuna became a master of all of those. Medicine, for instance, he was a great master. Uh, he was a great uh, um, phys physicist, I guess. Great knowledge of medicine, for instance. But in general, those were the main topics uh, scholars, academics at the time studied. And he excelled in them, but of course also became a great practitioner. In, in yeah, greatly respected practitioner. OK. All right, so that is Nagarjuna himself, and there's not much about him other than that, except you have these hagiographies. They're not biographies, they're hagiographies. So a lot of it is like, hmm, don't know whether that happened. It's kind of like praising him and telling about these mystical feats, and very hard, it's not really a biography. You get really confused about, well, what did he do first? What did he, in terms of time, it's not very consistent. But it just talks about all these incredible things that he's done. And no one knows whether these descriptions are that reliable. Okay, So it's not a biography, but a hagiography. All right. Now, looking at the text itself, now you can open it. <laughs> so these are, these were, these, I just have my notes. I kind of scribbled them in. But um, you'll see that the, the name is given. So. Because it's such a short text, everything is explained, even the, the name. The name is not that hard, so it's, it shouldn't be too, too difficult. And this is seen as a mnemonic eight. Mnemonic eight, that's a really weird word. M-N-E-M-N-E, monic, M-O-N-I-C. So mnemonic eight is like a, an aid to memorizing. An aid to memorizing. So a lot of these texts were written uh, such that initially a student would memorize this. I mean, it makes sense at a time when getting a book was really difficult. Not many books were around. So if you couldn't take a book and kind of walk around with it, you could just possibly borrow it, I guess, from a library or for someone else. And then you memorized it. Okay, and then you could give the book back and you'd be all right. You wouldn't have to carry a book around. Um, that was the, the ancient version of e-books. <laughs> you can all carry them around. In the, at that time, people memorized them, right? They had them right in their head. And then they would seek a, a, a master. And, then the, and because they were written in verse, that made it easier to memorize them. 
That was one of the reasons for writing in, in verse. Um, so to memorize it easily, it was a mnemonic aid in that sense. So an um, aid to memorization. And once you had memorized it, you went to see a teacher and the teacher explained you the meaning. You contemplated the meaning and started to meditate on it. Great, didn't have to look for the text. You had it right here. First you had memorized the text itself. Then of course you remembered what the teacher had taught you, because if it's right up in your head, you've already been wondering. Like even when we had to memorize, you go through things and you're wondering, what could that mean? But of course you know one day they'll explain it to you, but you're more curious about this than maybe other things. So because of that curiosity, you remember much better. So the point is that you've got an explanation, you sat down to meditate and you internalized it with the text right there with you. So this is an example of such a, a text that you would memorize in the past. Okay, so this text is called Mula Madhyamika Karika, as you can see. Umatsawa Sherap in Tibetan. <coughs> so Umatsawa Sherap, it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a literal translation of um, Mula Madhyamika Karika Prashna. Actually in Sanskrit it's Mula Madhyamika Karika Prashna. Prashna means wisdom. So in Tibetan, it's a little bit, the wording is a little bit reversed. In Tibetan, it's Madhyamika Mula. Uh, Madhyamika Mula Prashna Karika. <laughs> Other than that, it's the same. So Mula means root, right? So if you want to say root or foundation, Madhyamika as in like the middle way, free from extreme. Karika uh, versus like a condensed form of verses, and then prashna means inside or wisdom. So to loosely translate it, it's like the the verses, uh, the the root verses of the middle way wisdom. That's how a lot of people translate it. There's different way. I mean, some people call it fundamental wisdom or the the verses of the fundamental wisdom. Um, so. The root of the middle way, wisdom, I don't know. Boss, do, do, do you think there's another way? Would you, how would you translate it? But it? Foundation, yes. Root, yeah, right. You can use anything. Yeah, okay. But in terms of like the root referring to the middle way, right? Mula Madhyamika. Because sometimes people say it's like the root versus on. Uh, the root verses on the wisdom of the middle way. But some people say it's actually the root wisdom. Okay, so like where do you, uh, uh, where do you kind of, uh, how do you bring the two together? But I think the root, the, the, the root or the, the foundation of wisdom is, is probably the right kind of, the root, the root, the foundation of the wisdom of the middle way. So the verses on the foundation of the wisdom of the middle way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's a bit, a bit long, but okay. All right, so that would then be the title. And then the first, so this is what I'll do tonight before we go into the verses tomorrow. The text starts off with a verse of homage. Quite unusual. We don't start books with verses of homage nowadays. <laughs> Uh, even books on Buddhism don't necessarily contain that. But it was just, uh, well, we don't need to go into all the purpose on that, but it was traditional. It was traditional that the, the author was also a sign of humility, kind of saying, well, I'm paying my respects uh, to the person who inspired me, who, who I followed here, so in this case, the Buddha. So it's a verse of homage, as in like honoring the Buddha, Buddha honoring, sorry, Nagarjuna honoring the Buddha. But not just that, he also reveals the content of this text and the purpose of the text. So it's kind of an homage, okay, it's like a paying your respects to bow, it's all about bow, here, bowing here. But of course, as many of you know, of course I didn't see how many did the prostrations, but <laughs> it, it sounded like there were more than more than in the introductory courses. 
So, which shows that, of course, bowing is no longer, it's not misunderstood. When I gave a talk at a high school the other day, someone said to me, so are you bowing to statues? <laughs> I love that question. That was so right to the point. Oh, you guys, are you the ones bowing to statues? <laughs> right? It seems like that, kind of, okay. But of course, it's not to the statues, it's to what they stand for, and the bowing is a mental process. The physical just keeps us mindful on doing so. And of course, it's not about anyone requiring us to bow, it's more like an opening ourselves, to kind of lower ourselves, to receive something. It's just a, a kind of a respectful gesture that's just good for ourselves, that's the whole point behind it. And to bow, if, if we do the whole thing without actually thinking of the prostration, then it's just exercise. <laughs> so really, it's the mental aspect of it, like I'm opening myself, I'm ready to hear something new. It's kind of a, a, um, a level of humility, as in like recognizing I have more to learn, and I'm open, opening myself to hear more. That's all it is. Anyway, so here bowing to the Buddha himself, but describing also what is the content. So that which is dependent arising. There it is. That which is dependent arising. That is the content of this text. Dependent arising. But of course, not just depending arising, also emptiness. It's the two. But you can't separate them. You can't talk of emptiness without dependent arising. I mean, that'd be really hard. Um, and so the way I've learned this, so the, the Tibetan word, again, the Tibetan word for emptiness is a literal translation from the Sanskrit word shunyat, shunyata or shunyat. Um, and then the Tibetan word dependent arising, which is actually not dependent arising. The dependent arising in Tibetan is only, there's a short version, but there's a longer version. Having arisen, that which is arisen in dependence and in relation which my understanding is that pratitya samutpada, which is the Sanskrit word, pratitya samutpada is the Sanskrit word for dependent arising, it means that. So prati as in like, and I hope I get it right, like contact, dependence, reliance on something. Prati, then the ya, uh, never mind the iti in between, whatever. It carries the meaning of having, so that which has dependence. So pratitya as in like having uh, dependence or de reliance on, for instance, causes and conditions. So pratitya is in like reliance and dependence. And then the next syllable, sabutpada. So sam, um, it press, like it's apparently has, it connects to sambanda. There are different interpretations, but the one that I uh, read was sambanda, which expresses the idea of relation. And that's again what the Tibetans took on. Boss, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so then in Tibetan it's then ching dewa. Then as in like dependent, ching means and, dewa, relation, connected. Okay? So here it expresses so some, some, some banda, as in like samut pada sam, expresses the idea of relation, and pada means uh, stage or food, but it, in the context with sam, so samut pada, if it, those put together with the prefix samut, it means originated or having arisen, like originated basically. So samutpada therefore, pratitya means so therefore independence on, for instance, causes and conditions, and then pad, uh, samutpada as in like having originated in relation. So having originated in relation and independence on, for instance, causes and conditions, which is the same as in Tibetan, having originated independence and in relation to other things. Okay. So dependent arising really means that. And the word originated or arising, never mind, having originated, having arisen, it doesn't really talk of dependent existence, which we would expect when we think of phenomena existing in dependence on something else. We'd rather think of phenomena exist in dependence on other things. We don't think so much of uh, them arising in dependence on other things. But the word arising 
allows us to not only think of the fact that phenomena exist independent on other things, but also that when they came into existence, in other words, when they arose, when they came into being, they did so independent on other things. So if something comes into existence independent on other things, well, then it also exists independent on other things. So by, by way of saying, dependently arisen or dependent arising, if this table is a dependent arising, a phenomenon that a phenomenon that has arisen independence, that implies that when it came into existence, it did so independence on other things, and now it exists independence on other things. And of course, we'll talk about this later, but dependence can mean so many different things, especially in the highest school. Actually, we talk of three types of dependence, but they don't include all forms of dependence. We say an impermanent thing, an impermanent phenomena, so the things that we usually deal with, depends on causes and conditions. So when it came into existence, it did so in dependence on a cause, or on different causes, on different main causes, and different secondary causes, which are described as conditions. So main causes and conditions. Many, many causes and conditions. So the person who made this table, the material, the nails, what have you, dependence on that, that came into existence. And also, it exists now. So the second type of dependence is, so the first type of dependence is dependence on causes and conditions. The second type of dependence refers less to having arisen independence, but existing independence. This table exists in dependence on parts, on different parts, surface, legs of the table, different characteristics. Yeah, so right now, it, it only exists as a table because it has many different parts. And then um, it also depends on the mind calling it a table, right? Without someone calling it a table, it wouldn't be a table. So therefore, a table, an object such as the table, depends on at least those things. We'll go more into them, but just to give you uh, a rough sense on what things depend. But things depend on more than that. That dependence does not include all dependences. Can you think of something else that phenomena depend upon? But don't think of causes, like I depend on my parents to teach me things. Those are my causes, right? If my parents teach me certain things, or you teach me something, and the dependence on that, I understand this, and I go, oh, okay. So this person who's understood what you've just taught me, that is a new person with a new understanding, different from the person beforehand, before I was taught this, that, and the other. And so therefore, what you told me is the cause of the new me. So in that way, we keep changing all the time. We New impressions, new ideas are introduced, and those are all our causes. So many, many causes. So in that way, we depend on many causes and conditions. Each moment of myself, each moment of you. But in which other dependence can you think of, which is not mentioned, not as part of causes and conditions, not as part of parts, as in like belonging to this object, or imputation. Perceiver? Huh? Perceiver? No, the perceiver has already been mentioned. Well, perceiver mentioned as in like being labeled. The self? Pardon? The self? The table depends on the, the self? The self. No, no, the table, does it depend on something other than the self? <clears throat> no, no, sorry. But the, taking the table, for instance, the table, uh, this depends on causes and conditions. It depends on parts other than itself. And it depends on the mind to perceive it and label it. But could it depend on something more than that? Karma. This depends on karma? Mm -hmm. No, the fact that you see the table and experience it, that depends on your karma. But this table does not depend on your karma, does it? Well, I don't know. There's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Does it depend on each and everyone's karma to have this table around? R rules of nature. Pardon? Rules of nature. Rules of nature. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, gravity. Yeah. 
gravity and also uh, the four elements. But that would be the cause of the table. So gravity is the cause of the table. The four elements are the cause of the table. Very good. So definitely. But, pardon? Four elements are the parts. Well, you could think of them as the four elements as their causes, and you could think of the four.